inspire quizzical and we're back for a, another video whatever you want to call it um, <laughs> we're back for another video and it's biology week this week uh, so for the weekdays the first uh, so Monday to Friday we're releasing a podcast per day uh, and we talk about biotechnology and we're trying to do it in more general terms so the community can sort of uh, understand because biotechnology is really really important and it's really really relevant at the moment but unfortunately not a lot of people really understand how it can be applied and mm -hmm. It sounds dangerous to a lot of people when it's, it's really not, and this is what we're trying to illuminate, but we also do acknowledge some of the dangers, and I think that's going to be quite prevalent in this episode. Um, but first of all, um, I'm Stephen. I'm Ed. I'm Maddie. And today we want to talk about a very contentious issue, Eddie. It was brought up in Biotech Week a couple of weeks ago, actually, and it is genetically modified organisms, and most notably... <laughs> And most notably, genetically modified food or crops. Um, because uh, in Biotechnology Week, the researchers all, they all had a call to um, approve more genetically modified crops um, because they think there's not enough approval. Um, and I, 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 want to, I want to open this with a question, actually, for both of you, because I didn't know this until I read it. Do you know how many genetically modified foods, so things humans would eat, genetically, that's the difference between crops and food. Crops aren't technically eaten by humans. Food is eaten by humans, if you ever see that. So do you know how many genetically modified foods are sold in the UK? Should I ask another question and say, what's your definition of genetically modified? Uh, we'll get on to that. Basically, <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah, so, laughs> no. <laughs> we, we, we will get on to that. That, 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 that is a big topic. But I just, I just wondered if you know how many how many genetically like three? How about saying it's commercially? So you could go down to a maybe a shop that decides to sell genetically modified foods. Do you know how many are sold in the UK? No. I you know if you went three, <laughs> then I'd go like three thousand. I have no idea. Is that gonna be lots or none? Yeah. <laughs> it's zero. I, really? It's I want zero. This has got to be a definition. <laughs> There. So, I, and I read this on the UK government website as well, that they now, there's genetically modified crops. Yeah. Um, and we don't grow genetically modified crops, but we do import them. And why have just got <laughs> So, we do import them. Um, yes. The UK is particularly phobic of genetically modified food. That was just crops. in the UK? Yeah. Yeah. No, no, and, and to be honest with you, the rest of the world, especially Europe, do follow suit with this not a lot. No. But like the US more? Uh, possibly. They, they tend to have less restrictions on their food standards anyway, in general. I will say in general, <laughs> because they're allowed to use things like growth hormones in their cackings. And they've only just banned um, trans fats as well. Yes. Modified trans fats, which you find in yeah, like the worst fats. Which are literally uh, awful. They're basically poison, and yeah. they've only just. But the, it's really interesting, the FDA has banned them now, mm. but they've still given the industry two years to really? get them out of the system, yeah. which is bad, because it's basically like, we know you're poisoning our people, but we'll give you two years still to do it before you change over yeah. Yeah. It's a crazy system, but that's the way that I think this is it's another part of what we're having to discuss today, and, which uh, has got big corporate interest versus yes. public. Oh, people. yeah, yeah, big time. And I think we need to go back to your question of, Genetically modified. What does genetically modified? What is the definition of it? Now, personally, as a biologist, I would say genetically modified is or organism. Let's call it all organisms. Is an organism that we have purposefully changed its genome yeah. for a reason. I would agree with that. Oh yeah, I mean it's got to be if you, even if you break down the actual words themselves in in colloquial languages. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's well, that's well, where it's got to be. I mean, there's no it, there can't be any extension yeah. upon that. Now, really. what you read, though, I Googled it. which is what I say is the what is probably more like a legal description to to define it is a genetically modified organism is something that has been had its genome modified in a lab and had yeah the gene taken from one organism and forced into the genes of another. Yeah, see that's, that's a, a that, but see that's a trans organism because that's that's something that's, that's a transgenic yeah, organism. Yeah, see that I just see that I think. But, uh, yeah, I mean a transgenic organism is an organism that has a gene from something that's not within its species. Yes. I think it said a non-related. Not related species. I think that's what it's like. And that, see, that, that sounds like a legal term to me. It's that's got to be. I mean, yeah. it's something that that's got to be. Like, if you look at uh, the legislation around this, there must be so many 
must have had so many big legal teams working on. Well, we can't, can't say so many we can't cases. say this because if we do this, then it bans this. Everything is genetically modified, and they probably don't want that. Well, this is how, it. How long have humans been genetically modifying? What's the oldest genetically modified organism that you can think of? Well, I'd like to. Well, it depends on what was the most, the first domesticated animal. Because essentially, as soon as you get domestic yeah. domestication, and you've got as, as far as my produce, research went, I went to dog. Yeah. So dogs were between, depending on where you look at, between ten and thirty thousand years ago, we started domesticating wolves, yeah. and and the dog that we know now, Canis familiaris. Yeah. Um, Pretty well alive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't perform this. Um, <laughs> Is, is basically, it's, humans have created that species from Canis yeah. lupus, which is the grey wolf. Mm -hmm. And um, it would be similar with like chickens or with that. Well, so chickens, right, technically, like, chickens are technically are just still Gaulus Gaulus, which is just a direct Yeah, I know it's not a new species, now. but we've like changed it, haven't we? We, we do affect them, but we haven't affected them to the point where there's a speciation. Yeah. And there is a speciation with dogs. And uh, all the different breeds of dogs are the same species. Oh, yeah, oh, 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 yeah, definition of species now. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah. But they, they are regarded as a, well, okay, I can't tell you what, Canis lupus is the grey wolf and Canis lupus familiaris yeah. is the dog, but the dog is usually seen as a different species. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry? Familiar. familiar is domesticated, yeah. 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 And of course, with um, you say about domesticated chickens, they're not seen as uh, a different species, but they are Canis, Canis domesticus. Are they really? They so are, it's yeah. again, it's sort of another subspecies of the red, of the red jungle fowl. Yes, yes, basically, uh, yeah. So yeah, so I mean, yeah, I've always argued this with people that I've had conversations with about regarding uh, GMOs or yeah, uh, genetically modified food is that you know you you know you're quite happy for it to be you know with beef and any sort of domesticated livestock, you could you could definitely create an argument for the fact that we have altered something that used to look like a bison or an ox yes. into a, a meat production animal. That is the Yeah, and they're stocky, they produce more meat, or for milking cows, they produce more milk, bigger mm -hmm. udders. And we've we've done this by what's called sexual selection. Yeah. And this again, this, this goes back to a, a previous episode that you recorded. Um, sexual selection uses vertical gene transfer. And you yeah. take, if say you want, okay, say you've got two plants, because we do it a lot in plants, and you've got a plant that is unusually large, and you go like, oh, that's, I would like it to be larger, because larger crops mean more food, more nutrition. And then you find another plant that's unusually large. So you breed them, because then you get those genes going out. And even before we knew what genes were, we knew that if we bred two large plants, we'd more likely get another large plant. And if you do that enough, you stop getting small plants, and you only get large plants. This takes generations of vertical gene transfer. These genes go into progeny, into progeny, into progeny. But what their definition of gene modi modification is, yeah. is pretty much the sped up version of that. Yeah, which is, but we use the horizontal gene transfer. So the output of it is yes. like the same thing. Well, there's two key points to that definition in the sense that the one's got to be in a lab. Yeah. With the inner lab thing, well, you tell me what a laboratory is, because as far as I'm concerned, anything with a sink and a workbench is, it can be used in the lab. Any, anything where you're performing some sort of science is a lab. My kitchen table, like a cup of tea, is a lab. I'm boiling water, I'm taking a chemical, I'm extracting it from leaves yeah. to create a substance, a, a, you know, a new substance, which is tea. Technically, your kitchen's a lab. So but they probably mean a yeah. sterile environment, yeah, yeah. yeah like, there will be a legal definition for a lab, I'm very sure. But, but, but going back to, sorry, just sexual selection, because this, this does annoy me as well. Sexual selection is gene modification. And even if, and, and because we've been doing and the, because we've been doing it before genes, we knew what genes were, we don't see it as that, we see it as a very normal thing. And the best example of that is the mustard plant. Because the mustard plant has been selectively bred to give you broccoli, and Brussels sprouts, and cabbage, and cauliflower, and mm. kale, and a ton of other stuff, it all come from the same plant, all from the same genus. And all it is is just, just over, over you know decades or hundreds of years, we've just bred new things. But we've taken a plant and completely changed it. Most of the plant looks nothing like broccoli. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the interesting thing is that I think this comes hand in hand with industry, because the, the minute you start creating these domesticated livestock and you start selling them, you create a financial interest. Yeah. And that's part and parcel of, you know, if you look back at um, human diets since the Industrial Revolution, we eat fraction of what we used to eat in terms of variety of vegetables I, versus I've vegetables. actually got stats on this. Yeah. So, um, I don't have my stats at home. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, um, I think it's something like 90% of our diet comes from 30 crops. Yeah. That's all we eat. Out of all the 
massive amount of props in the world. 90% of our diet should be 30 props. It's crazy. Can you believe that? Yeah. yeah. You can't really start trying to think of vegetables unless you, you know, unless you really go out of your way to think, you know, to and go out. What's the first thing you think when someone says vegetables? What's at the supermarket? Yeah, yeah, exactly. But you know, you mentioned the, the broccoli plant, and you, you know, actually look at even simpler things like that, like corn of a cob. Yeah. You you look at what an actual corn uh, ear should look like. It's all it, different colours as well. Yeah, and it shouldn't look I like this. The old what used to be normal carrots are mm. like purple. Yeah, well, isn't that isn't that the? Yeah, no, I don't know if it's an old wives' tale or not. You know, I'm full of this stuff that I've just like picked up. And before. again, though, this is a problem with with with. Um, because we're in biology, we, yeah. we hear the facts. Outside the outside world, you hear all this hearsay, and this stuff that's yeah. been passed down for like so long that people just believe it's facts, and a lot of times it's not. Well, I think there's a, there's a definite, I, mean, I hate to bring it back again, but there's a definite push from um, commercial interests. You know, if, you're, if, you're making, if you're making a product, and you can create a genetically modified organism which will undercut the price of your product by a massive amount. Yeah. You're going to do everything you can to make sure that that, yeah. that product doesn't come to market and basically take out all your profit. And this also, um, there is an issue with, uh, well, I say an issue, this is also something that's happening with organic farmers at the moment. Right. Um, now, I, I don't want to touch on farm, I don't want to go into farming too much, there's a lot of research on it, and it's A, not interesting. <laughs> it's not so pertinent to this, yeah. but the way we farm now is unsustainable. Yeah. And, and I mean unsustainable in the sense that in a couple of hundred years we're going to have to seriously start thinking we can't do it. The way we've been farming for 10,000 years has ruined the soil. Well it's not only that, you think about the sheer space that you need for a, for a, 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 like a field of wheat or a field of um, any sort of crop. Like that, that volume of space. I mean, what are we up to? Seven point something billion people on this planet now. Yeah, that's it. You know, we're heading, we're heading for way more than that. There, there simply isn't going to be the room, not, and, the, yeah. not the agricultural room, and, because there's so much of the planet that the, is not viable. We're not replacing water in, in ground reservoirs, so yeah. that's getting low. Phosphorus is actually, they reckon in a couple of hundred years that the, the phosphorus level in the ground will be so low you won't be able to farm. And not without an addition of fertilizers for sure. Yeah, but that, including that, they say oh, it's really? just not replenishing it for some reason. It's just not getting back in. We, we like to think that Earth has this great cycle where nothing gets lost, but Earth is not a closed system and things do get lost. Yeah. And we are, and, that, and we also create a horrendous amount of just arid land. So land that we used to farm is called arable yeah. land, and that's shrinking. Rapidly, yeah, um, and the arid land, just land that we cannot grow anything on anymore, is growing rapidly. Mm. Well, one of the biggest things we're facing in this country is an obesity epidemic. Now, that's that's born out of the fact that people have got poor nutrition. Now, if you can or if you can generate nutrition in foods that people are happy to eat, yeah, you know, you know, even if you because they wouldn't even need to get people to change their diets, which is part of, part of the problem is that at the moment. People don't want to pay the extra for healthier foods, Just and they don't know how. Unhealthy people. Well, I mean, it would, it would technically say when you think about the cost of the NHS per year, yeah, and yeah. the strain that things like obesity and then the obesity is a big strain on the NHS. Yeah, right? I mean, if you if you can then reduce that strain by just addition, adding something into the into the diet. Yeah, even or, if they don't take something out of it. Yeah. Well, it's like um, folic acid has been added into, it was taken out for a long time, it's been added back into cereals. Has it? Yeah, so because it's a massive benefit of uh, a developing fetus, so pregnant women need massive amounts of folic acid. Now, by simply adding that into foods, you 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 minimise that strain on the on on sort of medical services. Now, I don't see that as any different. To basically getting, you know, if you're growing it within the plant, it's a one, it's a bit of one less step to do it. It's and to be honest with you, it's exactly the same as buying a banana. Yeah. Bananas do not look like that originally. We have we have selectively bred them. We have genetically modified them to be. And bananas are very unnatural because they're all clones of each other as well. Yeah, they're a single, they're a single individual. It's not even a yes. single species. It's one individual. One individual. They have yeah. genetic clones of each which, other. Which is why uh, a few years ago. Uh, or quite a few years ago, there was a banana crisis. Yeah, there was a banana crisis where there was a disease wiping them out, and they they were just burning whole fields of bananas, almost like the way we did with foot and mouth. Yeah, uh, you know, they, they would burn whole fields of bananas because because they're all clones. They got no resistance against this disease. Well, we moved from the Saint Michel to the Cavendish, I do believe. If I get my bananas around the right way. Oh yes. 
But yeah, I mean, yeah. if you, yeah. as long yeah. as they're kind of a little bit green with a little bit yellow. Well, they, cause they, well they should be, um, they should, there's bananas technically a berry, I think. Yes, they are. So, I mean, they should, the, the black bits that you see in the middle of the banana, like. It should be a seed. That should be a seed. Yeah. But we, we have again modified them to be seedless. Yeah. And, and if you think about it, you can't plant new crops. Like you've got no seeds. Yeah, like seedless grapes. Yeah. But, I mean, and. Although you know it's not it's not the stereotypical genetically modified organism that we think of, the argument can definitely be made that these things are our versus. Well, we've thing. modified their genome yeah. artificially. Yeah. You know, and you look at a you look at a dog. I mean, a chihuahua looks nothing like a grey wolf. No. We, we I mean, it just took a long time. Yeah. It just took a long time. But if if you took, I mean, I'm not saying do it to dogs, but if you took, if you changed enough of their genes with genetic modification in just a couple of generations, you'd go from wolf to a chihuahua. And, mm. the, the, and, and I think the problem is as well is when the word artificial comes into it. Because mm. artificial, especially in the newspapers, is bad, it's evil, and it's going to kill us. And it's absolutely not true. Well, yeah, and I think it comes, it comes attached with that tag of, you know, scientists are trying to play God. Yeah. Which is a complete fallacy. We're not, we don't even, half of them don't even believe in God for a start. Yeah. <laughs> which, is a, which is another thing entirely. Yeah, that's so, another debate. There, there are, you know, there's, I, I get it that there is, you know, scientists need to be kept in check. I agree that there, there does need to be a check and balance system of yeah. what scientists are able to do. But, you know, majority of them aren't malicious. There's no, there's no nefarious activity going on there. They're, they're out there to basically create something for the greater good. Yeah. And, <laughs> uh, and, it's, and, it's, and it's that that they're trying to do. It's not that they're trying to create something that's you know going to decimate populations or you know create these huge issues. Now, and again, I agree that you know there are there are questions to be asked about GMOs and about whether the, the genes themselves can be transferred across different species. Because I, th I think I read something very briefly the other day, and I, I, I did what I admit it was very brief. That they think that the DNA, the genetics, can actually be passed from GMOs into humans when they eat them. I read that, but I didn't. I didn't get into the nitty gritty of it, and I would recommend anybody who's listening to this go and read it themselves again. I, I read it, and it's it's not scientific. It's not um, it's not all scientific jargon. I think it's very easy to read. And the basics of it is that they're worried that if we genetically modify foods, uh, and we spoke about this on the last episode, um, but. To, to insert a gene into something artificially, um, mm -hmm. we, we, we insert the gene along with usually some sort of antibiotic resistance, like resistance to ampicillin. And all that does is, when we test it with ampicillin, if it survives, it's got the gene. And, and that's how we can tell which ones have got the gene, which ones haven't, because it, it's not 100% perfect. No. Um, so we need to be able to filter out things that don't have the genes. Um, so once we've got the thing that we, we want with the genes, of course, there's ampicillin, Resistance there. So the worry is that we'll eat stuff and our good bacteria will get ampicillin resistance, but then when, because our good bacteria is good and we need it, but we also get bad bacteria going through there. You know, if you get food poisoning, you get like E. coli or something like that. But then, say, the um, through horizontal gene transfer, which is really, really common, it's, it's just an absolutely normal thing for bacteria to do. Mm -hmm. uh, the, that is how antibiotic resistance spreads so quickly, is through horizontal gene transfer. But that's also how we make GMOs. Yeah, I, I just don't. I don't see a lot of. I, I get the moral argument, I suppose, on a, one level, but I do think that a big part of why there is so much red tape and uh, so few product available on the market is purely because people are trying to protect their own financial interests. Yeah, yeah, and I, I read about as well when. So we we've been doing genetic modification in the sense of in a lab mm -hmm. for decades, but. Um, it was pretty new for, for a long time, and people didn't really hear about it or understand it or anything like that. And in the late 80s and early 90s is when this argument really started, because uh, genetic modification really got out to the public. But the public weren't taught what it was. No. And if you don't know what it is, it sounds really scary. Yeah. It's just like, oh my god, they're, they're changing these... I mean, bacteria is usually bad. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we think. I mean, bacteria is actually very good in, in a lot of cases. If we die, we have bacteria in us. Um, but you know, you usually hear bacteria is bad. Oh, they're changing bacteria to be this and that and have this and that, and that's why we're doing that. It's scary. And yeah. you know, you, when we talk to people, you do get that sense that people are a bit worried about it. I think a new word that's been added into the public zeitgeist recently is the word CRISPR in, the, in response to yes. genetic engineering. And again, I think the same problem is happening again, whereby there's there's a massive misunderstanding with what 
CRISPR is and what it's capable of. Well, I say it's the capability. I know there's the people worry about the potential of it. Yeah, well, I can. I, you know, uh, the designer baby argument comes up again and again and again. But people, I, I've listened to the, so, you know, a lot of podcasts and things. They talk about CRISPR and things, uh, and they are you, they're talking about the idea that you know you could use CRISPR to edit your genome to do this, that, and the other. Yeah. Which you can't. You I, can't. I could. I couldn't use CRISPR to engineer my genome right now. Because I'm too, I'm too far gone. If I was an embryo, that's a completely different situation. I'm a yeah. single cell at yes. that point. Or yeah. even if you're eight cells, that's a, that's a completely different system. On to, but this idea that, you know, and it's being fed out there to millions of people that you, know, you could use CRISPR to give yourself uh, more muscle density, more you know, better mass, or you could edit out genes for Alzheimer's. And it's just not possible. But we're, you see, we're composed of including any bacteria that are in us just for ease. We're composed of like 10 trillion cells. Yeah. Now, editing a, an embryo, that's, even if it's just 128 cells at, at that yeah. point, isn't that hard. You, you flood it with these, you flood it with the, the, the CRISPR system and, and you change the genome. Us, you couldn't do that. No, no way. You know? Well, not, not with what we've got available. No, I mean, no. And I think this is the problem is that there's a big misunderstanding between where we are at the moment and like what is achievable and where it's going to go. And I think, I think there's, a, there's too many people out there that are, you know, scientists are aware of the moral implications of what's going on. Beyond, beyond aware, that the, yeah. one, one of the people who was originally part of making CRISPR has campaigned big time to make sure that he gets used responsibly. Yeah. Really what they want to do with the baby, going back to babies, is we're not really worried if babies have blue or green eyes. What we don't want them to do is have Down syndrome or, yeah. or have these genetic defects that we could remove with CRISPR. Well, I think even the more severe ones. I mean, Down syndrome, you can, you know, is an argument. There's an argument there that can be made that it is a, you know, it's a survivable condition. Yes, they have a shorter lifespan, but and it'll maybe a lower quality of life. Yeah, I mean, there, again, it's an argument to be made. But there are certainly ones like the the mitochondrial diseases, which are, you know. They're going to be born. They're going to live a life of pain, which is going to be yeah. remarkably short. Yeah. Uh, you know, and then a simple genetic engineering tool could then completely change that. You could have a completely viable person, which is which is quite interesting when you think about it, because it's quite common that the same people who argue against abortion argue against things like genetic engineering, particularly in babies. Yeah. And you think, well, okay, if you're if you're having this moral argument about the fact that you know life starts from the the minute, uh, you know, even if it's the minute that conception happens, you could then if life is precious, well, do everything you can to make sure that that's it's a healthy, that's a healthy yeah. life. That's yeah. that's part of the argument. And then you know, we, we always I mean, one of the arguments. I mean, I don't want to go too far into abortion, but a lot, one of the arguments is always like, you could be killing the next Einstein. You don't know if these genes line up, and they could be yeah. some sort of science savant or something like that. It's like okay. But what if I said this one gets a mitochondrial disease and they die really, really early? They don't get the chance to be to they flourish be as, a, yeah, as a person. Do it. And and I think they, it is a, it would be a real shame if we turned around and went, oh, we can get rid of these genetic diseases now. At least we, we can help them. Mm. But we're not going to use it. We're just going to we're, we're very going to use it to make bacteria that produce an enzyme that we want for a biosensor or something, which is a great use of it. Mm. But at the same time, we already have things that do that pretty well. What we really, really want to do is make sure that humans are born without these genetic defects that are still fairly common. Yeah, I think we're slightly, we're slightly going back to the idea of genetic determinism that we talked about in our first podcast with the movies thing, whereby people think that you know your genes purely dictate what who you are from the minute you yeah. go. When <clears throat> actually epigenetics has now shown that you actually during the period of your lifetime alter your genetic regulation. Yeah, yeah, you do. You so your genes are not all the time. Yeah, and then you know, and your life choices, the amount of coffee you drink, the amount you smoke, the, you know, the amount of exercise you do. Where you live your life, whether you live up a mountain or down, yeah. you know, down next to a river, that will actually affect what happens to your children and your children's children. So I think there's, there's, this is a developing area that people, you know, there needs to be a greater level of understanding in the in, in the public, yeah. so that they can look at these, you know, these sensationalized articles, regardless of whatever the you know, the argument is across, you know, genetics, and then go actually. That's not true. Yeah. That's got some relevance, but we can take this with a pinch of salt. Like, and, and yeah, what you need to remember, you, the, the great thing you said there is sensationalized articles. Yeah. Newspapers need, they need to sell newspapers. Mm -hmm. And sell a newspaper which, is, which says, Chris is pretty good, yeah. doesn't sell a newspaper. No, no, no. no. Now, now you can go down certain newspaper routes, which is 
Chris was going to kill us all. Yeah. I won't say what newspaper it is. I mentioned it in the last episode. Um, yeah. uh, there's a few like it. But there's other newspapers that may be like, oh, Christmas is great. And it is, it's, it's not going to kill us all. It is great, mm. but it's not as great as we think. No. It's still in its infancy. Well, well yeah, at the moment. Yeah. Okay. And I think it's one of those things of, it, you know, Crisco is great, but that, yeah. that's the, the, the but bit is that you That's know, the bit they miss out as well. Yeah, and you need to, and it needs to be kept under control. I do understand, you know, it needs to be regulated. You know, scientists do need the odd kick just to be like, that's not ethical. Yeah. There's definitely an ethical argument always. The scientists are very good at looking at something and going, oh, we can do all these things. Yeah. But not thinking it's the big thing. You just need someone looking over your shoulder and just going, yeah, but maybe you should. Just getting excited by the science. Yeah. Maybe maybe think about it. Well, I just think (laughs) that really on balance, particularly to go bring it back to GMOs, back to where we should be, (laughs) is that, you know, we should be in a situation where um, that is more, the, the, the moral balance is actually in favor of them, not against them. So I think at the moment in the general population, there is there is a gentle shift towards a more positive outlook on things like GMOs and GM foods. And I think that's because we're starting to see a lot of positive things come out of it. Um, in the UK especially, and in the rest of Europe as well, GM foods are really, really disliked still. Uh, they're still more negative. And I think the point is that the press doesn't help with that, they sensationalise stories. What you've got to realise is they're selling newspapers. They, they, they sensationalise stuff because it sells, but they're not always transmitting facts. And the best thing to do is if you are really interested in this and, and are sort of on the edge of each opinion, is to go look at actual research. Mm. And it doesn't, it sounds complicated, but really the core ideas of the research are transmitted. Uh, and, and obviously, if you start looking at multiple sources, you start getting at least the core idea of what's actually going on. Best source for that would be just if you're a if you're a general pop, uh, from somebody in the general population, I would just go on scholar.google.com. Yeah. That'd yeah. be the easiest way to get into the research. You know, you're going to come up against some research papers that are going to be quite complicated, but others that yeah. really you know you'll you'll understand fairly fairly easily. And what you'll see, what you'll quickly find out is that it's not as you know the the potential uh, applications of GMOs are far beyond even what the papers read. Oh, so they'll, they'll yeah. tell you that they'll give you the doom and gloom scaremongering stuff, but realistically, they're, they're not actually covering a lot. Um, you know, the idea that you could you could put vaccines, edible vaccines. So yes, yeah, yeah, they, yeah. They, want to, they want to do that. Put edible vaccines in in plants, basically. So we yeah, have, yeah. So you, the idea being that you could get a plant, you could hijack a plant system to um, create subunit vaccines, which are uh, things like Ebola or for. Um, what was the one we were talking about? Cholera is another one that's like a subunit vaccine. So this is like the toxin, uh, they break down part of the toxin and they introduce it to your system. Same way, uh, same way a traditional injection vaccine would work, but you actually eat it. Yeah. So uh, you wouldn't have to change anything about the way you do things and you'd be able to transport these things without the need for refrigeration, without yeah. the need for hypodermic yeah. needles. <laughs> that's a major thing. Because they do want to move away from needles, because needles are about 150 year old. Now, well, if you think about it, you, the idea of you having to break the skin in order to do something like that, I just don't think it's necessary anymore. We've got it's, ways of getting around yeah, it. And it's an infection risk. This is what I mean, particularly in places where you've got, you know, uh, hepatitis. hepatitis C and HIV risk. Yeah. Why why create that risk when you don't you know you don't need to? Exactly. I just again it's that it's that moral balance thing. It's like, yes, I can see the idea, the problems with it, but I still think the moral the moral balance is much in the in the in the favour of going ahead and using these things, um, as, long, as long as the science works out. Yeah. Because yeah. uh, you know we've talked about on, on previous uh, videos we all podcast that you know that gene um, sort of post translational modifications are key to basically how these things work, uh, and plants have got some post translational uh, uh, glycosylations where they add sugars to proteins that are immunogenic. Yes. So they create this, um, you know, the immune response against um, in humans that you, know, you you wouldn't want. So as long as the science adds up and these things don't they don't cause mass reactions and things, I don't see. I personally think the moral argument is is for not again. Yeah. And and what isn't reported on very often, because in all fairness, it's not very interesting to read. No. Um, is there's so much restrictions on what they can do. And there's so many hoops they have to jump through. It takes about 13 years to get anything out of the lab. Yeah. And it takes millions and millions of pounds or dollars or whatever your currency is. 
And um, the shocking thing is, if I wanted to turn, um, if I wanted to take a mustard plant, mm -hmm. say we hadn't done this, and I wanted to take a mustard plant and I wanted broccoli, you can do that sexual selection. It's fine. They're not even going to check. You can do what you want. There's, there may be some checks, brief checks, not many, and in some countries there's none at all. But if you did it genetically modify the organism, exactly the same, taking the genes, but doing it in one generation instead of taking tens of generations, it would take about 13 years to get on the market, it would be thoroughly tested, animal tested, it would go through a horrendous amount of tests just to make sure that it's safe. It's the same system. It's yeah. the same system. We, we use a different method to get there, but it's the, it's the, the same result. Um, and countries at the moment, and I personally believe this should be looked into, is that your, your plants that may by sexual selection are just almost unregulated. In some countries they are unregulated, mm -hmm. but GM foods aren't. Uh, you know, aren't unregulated, they are regulated, heavily regulated, almost ridiculously regulated. Then there is a need for regulation because of what we talk about with the antibiotic resistance. Well, I think it's also that it's, it's, it's also regulated to those people who need it most. Yeah. That's the thing, you're, you're depriving those, you know, it's very easy sat in England, in a university, to think about, you know, how easy, you know, this, that and the other is, but the real impact on people is that these things are going to go to countries where, you know, it, food isn't as available as we have it here. Like, like the golden rice bit yeah, Exactly, yeah. perfect example of the fact that, you know, we can, we can help people who have less achieve more, and I just don't, I, we can bring everybody up to this same standard of living. Yeah. We just we just by using a very simple genetic. And, and like you said, scientists they're not they're not here to destroy the world. No. They want to make it better. They want to make people healthier, and they have the tools to do that. And there is a, a bit of a culture where people are starting to look on experts as if they know the least. Mm. Uh, and I don't want to go too far into that, but I hear a lot of people say, "Experts, what do they know about the real world?" It's like actually they know a lot. Well, they, they live in it. They, yeah, and, and they know the, they know the real stats. They know that 125 million people in in the world they are at risk. They have a label called expert who thinks they know stuff. Yeah, exactly. They spent their whole academic career learning something very specific, and like they, they know that you know 125 million people might go blind, and that's so. I would hate being blind. That's a horrible yeah. thing to happen, and it's completely preventable because all it is is a bit of an egg deficiency. And I know I keep coming back to that, but it's such a simple thing. It's a hard work. Yeah, it's, it's such a simple thing. And, and it's, it's like a big problem. And it's just pure nutrition. It's no, there's no genetics in there at all. There's nothing to say that they're predisposed to go blind. They just don't have the nutrition. The nutrition and argument do. is a huge one because like what we've already said about like poor nutrition, I think is causing a massive amount of strain on our economy. Yeah. So I think if you live, if people were to look at it with a completely, if they just came into the argument neutral, which is the problem, I think a lot of people come into it. Humans are inherently biased. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's the preconceived ideas are part of the problem. I think if you come into it completely neutral to the argument, then you will you will quickly see that, like we've all, like we've said, I know we we're massively in favour of as a group we we really are, but. Yeah. Yeah, and I, but we can I can see and acknowledge there are limitations and problems. And the regulation is uh, some regulation is needed. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know as much regulation you got now. Uh, some of the regulation almost feels like it's purposely trying to stop GM foods from being sold. Um, that's more of opinion based on my part. But some of the regulation really does seem heavy handed, uh, considering. Sexual selection. Well, I, I, I definitely think it is because it's again. I think it's just that people are trying to protect their profits. You think about it. the the major force in this is the FDA. Um, you know, Europe as a European Commission has a has a big argument for these as well. But you know, a lot of the world looks to America for their their standards, and the FDA are massively influenced by um, pressure groups and special interest groups that will put pressure on them in Washington to make certain decisions. And with with like the beef industry in Texas and with like the food industry in general in the US is so big and so powerful and there's so much money behind it, is that they can influence people to make certain decisions against the yes, against what is yeah. really for the greater good. Yeah, exactly. Um, I was about to say. <laughs> All about the greater good here, aren't we? Yeah. Um, and, and moving away from from the ethics a little bit, I do want to talk about some um, not GM foods, but GM crops. So um, potatoes, 
they've incidentally modified to produce more starch for the paper industry. Um, about seventy-five percent of all GM potatoes are poison paper, which is basically poison the industry. Yeah, of, of all GM potatoes, oh. I'll put I'll put into the, the base the paper industry for extra starch. Uh, and a lot of the time, these GM foods they just have herbicide and pesticide protection, so you, so you can kill pests that destroy crops without destroying your crops in the process, which means bigger yields. Which means more food, which means cheaper so food. How much pesticide resistance do you get? Yeah, so if you spray pesticides all over, all over, all over a field, which is a whole other argument, uh, to kill pests, because pests they destroy crops, yeah. but that pesticide might also be toxic to the planet. Yeah. So tomatoes are made to be uh, pesticide resistant uh, or herbicide resistant, one or the other. A lot of them are both pesticide and herbicide. And uh, when I did my research, the same things came up: herbicide resistance, herbicide resistance. Constantly. Yeah. And herbicides and pesticides, that's another argument for whether they should be used or not because they tend to lower biodiversity in the areas. Yeah. Um, and that, that is an issue with farming as well, lowering biodiversity. Um, but some GM crops are made to just repel pests. Yeah, see, I think that, that was what I was going to bring up with yeah. if, you'd, if, if you'd left it open, was the idea that if you can get away from using those chemicals at all, even all for the better, because, you know, if we can use these tools to do, you know, make them pest you know, pesticide resistant, herbicide resistant, then why not just straight up make them so that the pests yeah. aren't interested in them? I think that's much better on, on an ecological level. You can still allow for biodiversity there, it's just anything that comes into co contact with your crops either will be killed or just repelled. Yeah. Maybe, they, maybe you engineer a pheromone in them that these, these pests don't like, yeah. you know. Um, and obviously, unfortunately, you do you do see resistance arrive because of evolution and stuff like that. Um, and that is just something that we're tackling every day with, with bacteria anyway. That's that's not a new issue. It's extremely old. Well, I think that I think on the whole, food is going to become a bigger, a bigger and bigger issue over the next yeah, over the next decade or so, purely yeah. for the fact that you know, the, was it twenty thousand gallons per cow it takes per production. 20,000 gallons of water per cow, yeah. and we eat 40% of that cow at the end of the day. And, and, and a big so argument. That's a sustainable way of doing it, and we're going to have to find new avenues for food. And a big argument is, is a lot of cattle are fed on GM crops. So they go, a lot of GM crops just go into cattle feed, basically, yeah. and stuff like that. But then we eat cattle. Yeah. So, so, so and, and yeah, you, you get this trickle down effect that those compounds are getting into you. So if the cattle eat something with ampicillin resistance, then you eat it, you may get some of those ampicillin resistant chromosomes floating around, which could go into some of the. It, it's, it's something that's already happening, and we're not dead yet. No. So <laughs> it's it, a good yeah, and, fun and, fact. And the, yeah. the interesting thing is that I don't know uh, anything about it really, but the idea that you know we regulate our food to a huge degree, yeah. but we don't regulate animal feed the same. We don't you regulate think, our food's food. You think, yeah, well, this is it. Yeah. You think, but even if, if you mean, not food's food, but like dog food, yeah. I'm sure you wouldn't want to eat what was in dog's food, because like, they put action things into dog's food. Yeah, I, I, look, I saw something the other day, just an advert for like, looking after your dog, kind of thing. And they were saying about like the chicken, chicken dog food, yeah. It's got like a 4% chicken in it. So the topsoil is, you know, is, is being, being ruined. Uh, I did say like, you know, water levels and phosphorus levels aren't rising, uh, nitrogen levels are an issue as well. Everything's at an issue. And um, organic farming, which is like our original farming, mm. would actually make that worse to accelerate it. Yeah. So, so GM crops and GM foods are not the ultimate answer. I, w I will say that. No. They could be part of the solution, but there's other things that we need to do for farming. Um, yeah. But I think our fear of them is almost irrational, and, and it's just because they're so new. Yeah, I think exactly that, and uh, it's, it's that, the sensationalism that yeah. we've touched on before, it's, it's this, you know, and where you get your information for on, on these subjects is, is crucial, because if you're forming your opinions based on what is written in, you know, snippet things off the side of Facebook, yeah. or, uh, you know, all you know, re even what used to be reputable, you know, newspaper things that are, but you've got to understand that they're trying to sell something, and you've got to understand that every news outlet 
has an agenda, it has a political alignment. So if whatever politics they follow don't like GM foods, they will report it in a negative fashion. And it may not be outwardly noticeable, but it could be reported with neg negative connotations. But the best thing, I think good places are as well, a lot of scientists, a lot of biologists and other scientists, they, they run their own blogs or their own yeah. like, newsletters. Um, I actually, I've been following uh, one of our experts' newsletters, yeah. and they're really, really good. And they can be quite, I mean, I know we seem quite biased towards them, Mostly because we're educated on it. But I would, I would actually argue, read it all. Read as much as you can. Yeah. I read the bad and the good. So I, I understand bad. where we think the bad is. I, I read the bad and I thought to myself, I didn't realise with the antibiotic resistance getting to our gut or getting the animals to us. And I thought, and also, it's not just antibiotic resistance, it's also um, herbicide resistance. We're creating what we call super weeds, so weeds that just do not get killed by herbicides. That's also something that you've got to worry about. They know this, we know this, everyone knows this. It's not something that's going to be ignored. Yeah. Um, regulations need, but yeah. I personally think that GM crops could really, really help. GM food could really, really help grow bigger, more nutritional food. It could be really, really useful. Yeah, I agree. A, a good place to start. I think that's a good place to leave it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I, and this is such a big topic and a big debate. Feel, feel free to put a comment in the section below because we would really like to hear what other people think. We, we look at this through the lens of a biologist as much as we all have personal lives as well. Um, we'd love to know what, and I'm going to put this in echo, what facts people think that they've heard. And I'd, I'd love to be able to maybe even make a follow-up video on maybe dispelling or confirming some of those facts. That'd be, that'd be that'd quite interesting. Yeah, yeah. Just, yeah, exactly. Just discussing what these because um, we, we, we've kind of forgotten a lot of these old facts because we've, we've had the education around it now. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I would put it in the section, comment section below on YouTube or go over to our, we've got two separate Twitters and they've both got a team of people that are tweeting every day and more than this and we'd love to, we'd love to talk to the community, both experts and non-experts. So um, please go over to at Bioquizical on Twitter or at Biotech Musings on Twitter, which is Maddie's team. Uh, and we'd love to converse with you on there. Thank you very much for watching. Smash that subscribe button because we may be making more videos af after this little biology week thing and I think I would like to carry on, even if they're just five, 10 minute videos rather than you know, big long ones. Maybe they might be solo videos, they might be little podcasts like this or something like that. Yeah, and right. I think that'd be good, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, see you again. <laughs>